Welcome to another episode of With Miska. Today I have a guest. He's Polish. He's a Polish actor living in America, living here in LA. His name is Martin Harris or Martin Harasimovic. And we're going to talk about his names too. He has done some acting. He's a comedian and he has also been a promoter, a show promoter in the comedy store and in some other places. So that's actually pretty exciting to hear how that side of the business works. Everything with me is uh, pretty good. My horror film is almost ready. We have a scheduled release date at least in Finland and um, our American film, Finnish American film that is that was made here in LA called Someone Somewhere. That is finished too, and it's going to be released uh, very, very soon within... Well, I guess I can't tell the release date yet, but we're going to post it soon. So all is well. I've been... I've booked a couple of network roles, just like one, two, three lines or something like that. But uh, things are progressing here in LA also on the acting front. Uh, And I guess they are mainly progressing on the acting front because those are actually pretty big big news. I just hope none of my lines get cut. So we'll see. I'm going to let you know soon when the shows come out. Oh, there's a police siren. Well, this is Hollywood. And on the stand-up front, it's been fun because I've been able to organize a few shows in Finnish with Ismo Leikola. So I've been able to like host, be the MC of the show, and then also organize, because he's uh, rehearsing for his um, tour in fall tour in Finland. So I've been able to do Finnish stand-up comedy here in LA with Ismo. So that has been fun. Thank you for listening with Miska, and enjoy Martin Harris. Thank you for coming, Martin. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It was very. Very cool that you invited me. I actually realized that, um, well, I didn't realize, but I heard some time ago that uh, we have met before many years ago. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. But we, we met um, about eight years ago. Really? Yes. I didn't know about that either, but can you guess where we met? No. Uh, wait, wait. Was it the Beverly Hills Playhouse? No, but there's a Finnish connection. You might be able to figure it out. Finnish connection. It was on Fairfax. Uh, yes. Uh, was it a friend? I know that I was in a class with a Finnish actor who was a Judith Weston studio. His name was Yuk- Yuka? Yuha. Yuha. Hippie. Yuha Hippie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So I, uh, yeah. So we have met because you were, were you in class or were you roommates? No, we were in a class together. It was a Judith Weston uh, acting class for actors and directors. It okay. was a very good concept. Actually, I, I got a lot from that class. And, and to be quite honest with you, I recommend to everybody. It's a kind of a hidden gem in, in Hollywood. And that was my like second or third year in acting. And I was still trying to learn as much as possible. And I still do. And, um, and uh, it was recommended by a friend of mine who is a director. It's 50% of the class are actors. 50% are, are directors. So the directors uh, are being... Uh, taught for directing and so they work with actors and actors of course they are judged by their acting but but the scenes they kind of work together on the scenes director from the directing perspective and actor from the acting perspective so so it's good because it's both but at the same time you also you know meet creative people you work with them and and you never know what you know maybe in the future you work with them on real projects and the other good stuff is that once you go through that class and i still get emails Uh, you're on the email list, and when somebody needs a specific actor, they send emails to everybody who ever studied in this in this class. So nice, or, or director. Or how, how long did you study there? I, I took a, it's like a one course that you take. It's not like an uh, oncoming, ongoing thing. I think it's like eight weeks or something. And I think that's how I met with Yuka. Yes, But now I actually start to think that maybe we have not met. But that's the no, connection. No, I think we did actually. I, you're right about that. Because I, I saw Yuha a few years ago, and she said that he said that since I'm in LA, that have I met you? Because we have, we may have met before. I But think, anyway, that's the connection. I think it's very, very possible. And yes. Yuha is. A, I remember him as a very, very sweet person. Yes. Like a very, very nice, nice, gentle, very like friendly, friendly guy. Everybody liked him. 
And uh, cool. And was that when you came to LA for the first time? Yeah, like my story is insane. I mean, you know, like I still, I, I think it's the first year or maybe, I think it's the first year or second, the first year when I feel really comfortable in my own, under my own skin because I came here as a completely doing a completely different job. And w when did you come for the first time? 2008. I, I came 2006 for two weeks because of the job and 2008 I moved here where I was still, I was at the time 31 years old. And I never acted ever in my life before and never had a single acting class in, in my life, comedy, nothing. You know, my job since I was 17 years old and I was very successful in it was being a sports writer and sports broadcaster. In Poland? In Poland, but not only Poland. I, uh, I published and, and performed for BBC. I published in South Africa, Germany, France, um, Japan a lot. Uh, UK a lot, um, even Croatia, even Czech Republic. I, I published a lot. I was really I was an expert in 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 the field of NBA basketball, and and soccer. And I started working with 442 magazine, which I still write for sometimes. What was the magazine? 442. That, since 2004, it's the biggest soccer magazine in the world that pretty much opens every door. Okay. So so I came here because I wanted to cover one season of the Los Angeles Lakers. That was my goal. Like yeah. I wanted to spend one season with Los Angeles Lakers. I left the job, great apartment I had in Warsaw. I left the job and uh, at this uh, TV station. I had a you know, fantastic job there because they were paying me good money. I could pick games I want to broadcast. Like for example, this weekend I want to do this and this, and next weekend I want to do, you know, like, listen, it was great comfort. It was a, I was completely in a comfort zone. I could have stayed, got married, kids, and I would have a great life, you know? But of course, I wouldn't be myself in that if I didn't complicate it all <laughs> by making a big change. And, and I just wanted like, you know, to spend one season with the Lakers, and I was curious of the whole show business thing. I didn't know much about it, but I was curious. So I was thinking, like, what if I go there for a year? I will be one season with the Lakers, I will write a book about the Lakers, publish in Poland, and maybe, you know, take some acting classes and come back to Poland and maybe try to act here and there in Poland on some, you know, crappy TV show, small roles, whatever, you know. And then I went to Stella Adler Academy and they told me that I'm very good, apparently. So, it, and I, I, you know how it is in LA, they always tell you you're good, you know, some, but I, you know, you believe in it. Yeah. But I think they really saw something, you know, like I think it's one or two teachers and, and, and I, I started... This in 2000 and... 2000, the second half, 2008. Okay, yeah. So, so I stayed, you know, and people were like, we're shocked in Poland, like, what, what, what the hell is going on? Like, why are you not coming back? You said you're going to go for a year and come back and you're not coming back. And then, you know, in, at the same time I started studying in the Stella Adler Academy, I went to be an extra on the Angels and Demons. Yes, with and Tom Hanks. With Tom Hanks. It was in Inglewood. They built the whole set of Vatican, one-to-one. -one. They had like 1,000 extras in one scene. And at the time, I didn't even know the difference between actor and extra, to be quite honest with you. Uh, so I was super excited. They made me featured. They made me a, a reporter of Irish TV. I didn't have lines, but they put me next to other reporters. Ron Howard actually took, took me and put me in the, in the scene. So I, I was like extremely excited because I had Tom Hanks literally walking next to me. And the movie came out later this year and people saw me in it. And then, you know, I couldn't hide it anymore, what I'm doing, you know, what I'm trying to do. So, so it was that big feature extra that they saw you? Yeah, I mean, it was just feature extra. Yeah. But people saw me because it was a big movie. And That's uh, really cool. I was with all the other reporters. And your first uh, extra role. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Right now I'm laughing, you know, like people tell me he was in Angels and Demons. I'm like, no, nah, I wasn't really in Angels and Demons. I was just, you know, on set. But at the time, that was a big deal for me. Yeah, I have done background too. That was so a I know big deal for me, man. Yeah. Like I really thought I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing, doing something special. And which you were. So which I was for, for the time being, yeah, absolutely. So you said that uh, then people saw you in Poland. Yeah, and, and, and I didn't expect that. There was a lot, a lot of very negative, the, the reception, like some people were, some people were, of course, like, you know, well, that's cool, that's nice. But a lot of people were like, oh, what is he doing? Is he, did he lose his mind? He had a, such a great job in Poland. Now he's like, an, 
seen for two seconds in a, in movies world and he left and he was such a you know big star of you know f- in terms of dr- sports journalism i wouldn't i shouldn't use the word star but he was like an established serious uh, and and very successful sports writer slash sports broadcaster now he's making you know full out of himself and at the time i took it i took it hard man i it was that was heartbreaking for me you know i think i would have left uh, if i didn't have this uh, blowback back in poland if people didn't didn't react the way they reacted some of the people in media you know like people people who were technically my peers some of them were like laughing like what the hell is he doing you know what is he trying to do now and i took it hard man i was like oh okay well then let's see you know i'll take a step forward then and you stayed here and I stayed here and I w- invested more in, more time and my energy into acting from the, it, and it would, like, the, the theme will come back when we keep talking because I did the same thing again from the same reasons a few years later after that. Like I did something just because there was a reaction and I reacted to reaction. Like a reaction, it was like a reactionary reason for me to, to do something. So I did it twice. And, uh, but if, if that wouldn't happen, if I, if I didn't react the way I reacted, I wouldn't, I wouldn't act. I wouldn't be where I am right now. So, so although the premise of why I went deeper into acting was maybe a little bit artificial and and reactionary at the time, because I just didn't take the critics from Polish media very well, it all out, uh, Ultimately, it led into something positive, you know, at the end. So, so sometimes, you know, that's how life goes. The, the way you get into certain spots and places and, and things in life, sometimes it's not, not, a, not a simple blueprint, you know, and, and that was in my case. Like, if, if I didn't have that backlash, I would have gone back to Poland. I would probably go back to my old life. And maybe I would have tried to get a role or two on some Polish productions. But at the time... I was intrigued by acting, but I didn't take it as a serious career just yet. And how do how did you progress from that? So you you so they actually criticized you. Like why did they criticize you? They're like that I'm making fool out of myself. That I'm be right. I used to be a serious journalist. Now I'm like a two second. Like they they call it the guy. You, you you now you can see Martin in Hollywood, but only if you put it on a on a pause on your pilot, you know. Yeah, yeah, they like stuff like that. And, and this was right, on and media. Listen, right now, I'm six years in comedy, so I would I would have laughed if I yes. saw something like that. But at the time, I was like, oh my, those people, you know, like I was very angry. And there was this on media? Yeah, on media, yeah. Like people <laughs> in newspapers, like that, you know, that I'm that I'm that I lost my mind, that I don't know what I'm doing, that I that I'm trying to be a celebrity now, which was never the case. I never really wanted to be a celebrity. I always looked at life deeper than than most of the people. Like for me, it was all about you know su- s- looking for bigger purpose, you know, of doing anything I, I was doing, you know. Yeah. So I was never trying to be f- rich and famous as a lot of people come here. That's what they want to do. That was never my goal. I just I was just was curious by films. You know, it all started. It actually all started. I'll go back when I in I was twenty eight. I worked for the biggest sports newspaper in Poland, and at the time there was new newspaper that was being started by the biggest Polish publishing company, and they bought me out from this Polish sports newspaper. Like they gave me a very very good money to come and work on their project. So they came out. But the project wasn't as successful and they shut it down after one month and they gave me like six months salary, six months salary and pretty much sent me home like from day to day. So I didn't know what to do. And I remember I went to a shop that was in this publishing place and they released the series 25 biggest movies ever. So I'm like, I'll have a lot of time. So I bought myself a projector put it in my fancy apartment in Warsaw and I started watching this, those films that until I was 28, I wasn't even watching any movies or TV shows. I didn't know anything about movies. And that was, that was the first trigger when I was started being, you know, a little bit in, intrigued by, by movies and, and, and the whole thing, you know, and then, and it, it went deeper and deeper from that. So 28. Yeah. When I was 28, I started watching movies. Yeah. Nice. What did you learn? How did it feel? 
Uh, at first, I was a big fan. I still am. And it's the biggest dream of my life is to be in James Bond movie. And now I'm torturing my British agent about it. And she already talked to the office a couple of times and they're alert, you know, so hopefully, you know, hopefully. Uh, uh, yeah. But that's totally possible. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah. Because we, I think we, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I believe that too. I think it's going to happen this year, man. We, we, we are foreign guys. We have an accent and that's what the villains usually are. Yeah, but it's not not just the villain. I don't think I'll, they'll give me like a big part on this one because they're, not, they're right now casting small parts. They're, they're almost like halfway through with the film. But I even listen, like for James Bond movie, I, I watched every James Bond movie except for maybe two, at least 25 times. Some of Roger Moore movies I, I've, I've seen 60 times probably. Nice. We, what is your favorite one? Goldfinger. It's actually with Sean Connery. Roger Moore is my favorite Bond, but Goldfinger is by far my favorite Bond movie. How come? It's just a perfect film. Everything is great there. I just had this conversation because I worked on the music video on Monday and they painted me all red. I saw that on social yeah. media. <laughs> yeah. so, which was cool. And there was a girl and she's like, do you know if they paint your whole body red, you could die because your skin won't breathe? I said, yeah, of course I know. That was the premise of it. one of the greatest scenes ever in, in movie making in Goldfinger where a lady that betrays the bad guy uh, is being painted gold and put in the James Bond's uh, bed, and she's a dead body because they painted her gold, you know? So, so yeah, I know, yeah. So that's the biggest dream. Well, that's totally possible. Yeah. And this year? I think, I think in this one I'll be, yeah. Cool. I'll get something this year, yeah. So how, how do you actually go about it? Like, you said that your agent in London is talking with the office. Yeah. Like how At least that's what she says. Yeah. <laughs> so you call her? Oh, I text her. her every day. We talk every day. We talk every day. As a matter of fact... And we'll get to there to that point also when we t we talk about comedy. Like I'm a very team player, you know. Yeah. Like I'm very, I'm, I'm generally a friendly person. I, I consider myself being a friendly person. And whenever I see opportunity to help any of my friends, I do. So, so uh, two weeks ago, a friend of mine who is a director, he he directed this movie called Redemption Day with Andy Garcia and some some pretty big actors in it. And he said, "Hey man, I have a one day shoot uh, in London. I need to." girls to play bbc reporters so um, i text my agent hey sarah you know do, what do you think and she's like sure sure of course of course and we you know and and it happened this monday you know so she's now like even more into helping me so hopefully you know nice hopefully good karma will well i believe in those kind of things that the you know the karma karma will work out you know so hopefully yeah I, I think so too so you have agents all around the world Right now I do. Uh, I invested my time in it last year, you know, so, so now I do. Yeah, except of Poland. Yeah, it's the only you country. invested your time in what? In, f in finding like the right people in the right places. But what was the situation before that? Well, I know you've been living in LA for quite a while. Well, so, so here's the thing, you know, like, and, and, and that, that to, to make it chronological, you know, yes. so, so, so I, I, out of, out of, you know, the criticism, I, I decided to go deeper into acting and I, it was frustrating at times, you know, cause I finally booked a, a book couple of independent films first in my second year, a little crazy independent films, but I, you listen, you know, like I did very good job on those two scenes and people were laughing. They said, you're funny, you know, like you, you're a really funny actor, you know, like that. And so I, I was playing those crazy guys at the beginning, like yes. a little bit odd. Foreign. Foreign odd people, you know, yeah. and the, 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 with this crazy visionary art director, Gregory Hatanaka, he put me like in three, three movies. They were all low budget, but had some like Dominic Swain. They had like Noah Hathaway, who was the kid in the, in the uh, uh, never ending story. He was oh, the yes. kid. So he, then he didn't act. He went to Amsterdam for 20 years and then he, they brought him back and he did this movie with me called Blue Dream. Cool. And this is around 2010. 2010, yeah. Yes. And then, to that, and then I went to Beverly Hills Playhouse. Yes. Uh, can I ask, <coughs> ask you something uh, between... Um, how, how did you support yourself? Did you still do sports? I did or? sports, yeah. But it was difficult, man. I did extra work. I did audience work. I did anything. I yes, could. I have done both of those. Yes, I could. I, I did anything, and I, sometimes now I saved up pretty well, you know. But sometimes I do these jobs, and we'll get there. Why? Just to remind myself to to stay, you know, to stay focused and humble. Sometimes yes. I still do, do. Like right now, I do mainly brand ambassador jobs to support myself. Well, Although I don't have to support myself because I already saved up, but I still. It's it's a little crazy. I have this rule that every month I have to I have to be on plus, you know. So nice. What specific brand ambassador? Uh, 
I'm not asking for the brands, but what the. I mean, like for example, like let's say two weeks ago, I worked for a f- for a liquor brand on a big hip hop festival, just representing the brand. Right now, it's pretty easy, you know, giving people taste and stuff. I did not even that; just giving them free glasses. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And you said you said that every month you need to be on plus. Yeah. <laughs> that you you made more money than you spent. Yeah. Is is it working? Since eight years, I haven't had a one month where I was under. Eight years. Yeah. That's really good in LA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow! But there were months when I was really like starving myself, man. I, I'm, I, 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 I just method, method acting, you know. I just went deep into the method, you know. Yeah. So, so you made some money with uh, doing sports writing and whatever. Yeah. Job. yeah. So you, Beverly Hills Playhouse. Yeah, that was also another another good step forward. But you know, like, <clears throat> and I know that you know, like, there was. I used to be very high tempered guy. Sometimes, like someone who was giving me critiques, I was like reacting emotionally, and and I think I I I was like that till like two three years ago still, and I think s- some guy said something about my scene. One of the teachers. That's why I left Burley Hills Playhouse because I didn't like his, his critique, and then I went to Judith Weston, and then a big change happened. Well, first of all, in two thousand eleven, I booked a big movie, Battleship Studio Film, as yeah. a Russian announcer. Your first real... First big movie, you know? And I was like, wow. And, you know, and and they cut me out. <laughs> yes. Cause I, I have experienced that too. There were 10 reporters. And I didn't know at the time that, you know, with small parts, it happens all the time. Yes. So out of 10 reporters, they kept like three of them. Yeah. You had cup, how many lines did you have? Just two lines, maybe. Everybody yeah. had the same lines. Because there were like 10 different reporters. They used Chinese reporter... Spanish reporter, German reporter. Uh, I was the Russian reporter. Yes. And man, I took it hard. I was drinking for a week after that. I was like, they kicked me out of the bar after a week. Yeah. Did you was, go? Did you go? I was the, yeah. Like almost violent, man. I was. I was completely. I. I, I went on a spiral, man. So you went like really went on a spiral. Oh, I went on a spiral for a week. I was heartbroken, man. I. I was like, I'm done, man. I. I. I, I failed in my life. I'm a failure. I'm terrible. Did you tell many people about the job beforehand? Not many people. Not many people. Although I posted on Facebook, I think. Yes. I, I have learned about that. That you know, <laughs> I don't want to tell many people before I actually she, see it. Yeah, I've been cut too. So then... Did you get to go to the premiere party? No. No? No, no, no. So you were drinking? I was drinking, yeah. For like a week. It's not like I wasn't drinking before. I'm from, I'm from Poland, you know? So so I, I used to be pretty pretty... I never f- thought about it as a problem, you know, like we do drink a lot in Poland, you know, but I, I'm, I'm not drinking much right now. Like to be quite honest, I barely drink very, very rarely. But Why don't time, you drink anymore? Because I'm, I'm like on a, I like to play basketball and I'm, I just turned 42. Yeah. So whenever I, I have two, more than like two glasses of wine and I, I don't even drink a liquor at all, I just suck the next couple of days on basketball courts. So it's just, I want to keep, being act, you know, active in, in gym as long as I possibly can. And, and, and the biggest difference between being 22, 32, or 42 is when you don't drink and you stay in shape, you feel like, oh, I'm still pretty good. I'm still pretty fast. But then when you don't have a full night of sleep or, or you party, then it's a huge difference. Yeah. Huge difference. Plus, out of like three, four years ago when I was still drinking a little bit, I started having like a lot of back injuries and back spasms. So I also, you know, had to, had to stop because of that. Yeah. Who do you play with? Just, you know, with some bunch of people. Usually everybody's younger. I'm probably, probably the oldest guy most of the time. Yeah. In a gym? Or yeah, what? in the gym. But I'm a deadly shooter, so I, I still a lot of times score the most points. Sounds good. Yeah, I was sort of thinking, do you have like some, some kind of Hollywood actors league that you play or something yeah, like that? Yeah, man. Oh, that's uh, a tricky story. I've heard stories about. The- oh man, I played with so many celebrities in here in LA Fitness next to next to your apartment. I I played with so many celebrities. I played with uh, Josh Hutcherson uh, at the time when Hunger Games were on, you know, yeah. and nobody recognized him. And and one guy, because he was very feisty, he was small and but feisty, fast, but also he was a fighter. So he almost got into some fights, and I'm like, hey, leave this guy alone. He's a Hollywood superstar. And I was like, this guy, nah, what are you talking about? Yeah. And he was, because at the time, him and Jennifer Lawrence were the leads of Hunger Games. Yeah, that was like the biggest movie then. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I played with him a lot. 
I didn't see him in the gym for a long time, but also I played with the guy who kind of, it's a little bit more sad story. The guy from Glee who killed himself because he was accused of being a pedophile. I played with him a lot, a okay. lot. But no more. Well, no more because he hanged himself. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, and it was like when the Glee was on, when he was coming and, and, and he, was a, he wasn't a very good player. He always tried to throw the ball through through the backboard and and catch it and and have a layup, because he he couldn't really play much. He was yeah. basically giving me the ball, hey shoot, you know, because that's what I, all I all I could could have. Like I was pretty terrible dribbler before. I'm now I'm a little bit better, but I was always a great shooter, like spot yeah. on, you know. So it's usually doing that. Hmm. And you were talking you were talking about the drinking. So you were drinking for a week after Battleship. Yeah, after Battleship I was drinking a week and, and then a thing happened. A, a, a guy reached out to me, a questionable, I would say a questionable comedy promoter. Yeah. So he told you know, like I think it, I, it was through Craigslist. Where because I wanted to oh, Judith Weston told me, you do some comedy because you're very funny. You should try to do some comedy. So I saw uh, an an ad on Craigslist. And the guy met me. Uh, actually, I need to ask, uh, so Judith Weston, were you taking classes from her or was there somewhere else? Like yeah, that's that? the one with Yuka, the, the, the actor's director's yeah. lab. So it was actually Judith Weston. Judith Weston, yeah. Yeah, the lady who wrote the book. Oh, she wrote the book? I think she wrote like the really famous book. Oh, maybe, maybe. I, th I think she did. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. At least she's a, sort of a big deal in Finland. Oh, maybe, 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 maybe. So, so... Um, yeah, so the, she, you went to Greg, Craigslist... Yeah, I went to Craigslist and then I found this ad that, you know, you want to be, are you funny? You know, we can perform at the comedy store. So I met with the guy and he is like, okay, okay. He, but I said, I've never performed stand-up in my life. Yeah, I'll put you in the main stage. Don't worry about it. You know, I'll, I'll write your material. I'm like, no, no, I'm going to write my material. Okay, but we have to test it. You know, we will test it. Don't worry. Just bring me 10 people and we'll, find, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Just bring 10 people. So a bringer show. Yeah, I brought 10 people, including like two big uh, producers. Wow. And I was terrible, man. I was uh, completely awful. And there was really no class bad. before that? No. I went on stage and I had like a monologue about women from different countries, but it wasn't even funny, man. It was just like a, I had a, and I had dark glasses and I was pl pretending to be this international playboy. People looked at me with a pity. And, uh, and that was heartbreaking. And you didn't test it. Did you test it with, in front of anyone? Just this guy, you know, and then he, the next day he's like, oh, it was great, man. It was great. I'm said, no, it was terrible. No, don't worry about it. You had 12 people came. You were great. And I'm like, no, 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 man, no, no, no. Put me on stage next week. I'm like, he was like, you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. And then I called a few people, met with two comics, wrote some material. And this clip is actually still on, on YouTube. And that, that was my second time ever. I was super stressed out, but I, will, I, I did very well. How, how, can, how can I find the clip? It's on YouTube. But what? It's Martin Harris comedy, learning every day, something like that. Cool. Yeah, that's enough. It's still like a little bit naive humor. It's, it's like very European, I would say. It's, but, you know, people are laughing. You can hear people laughing throughout. So, so that was good. But then he asked me, you know. So to, you were to, talking about your foreign experience or something. Like yeah, it's like making goofy jokes, you know, like really goofy jokes but yeah. people are laughing you know because it was different than any other and everybody was terrible like the show was four hours long and everybody there was not not a single professional comic on the show so which room main room the big room yeah i i have not performed there so so i'll tell you so what happened so so there's just a few words about the bringer show so yeah. the, it, it meant that uh I'm, I'm guessing that um everyone needs to bring like 10 comics uh, th then o 10 audience members each yeah. comic needs yeah, to bring yeah. them and the audience and no, members it doesn't need matter to pay. if he's good not good no, nothing matters yeah i think there's still bringer shows once a week or something like that there are but it's different because and I'll, i changed the game a little bit i think at the comedy store i think i changed the game a little bit and we'll get to that okay so so he was, asking, he was asking me to bring more people, more people. So I'm like, no, I can't do it. You know, fine. I, I proved something to myself. I go back to acting. You know, that, that was a cool experience. Thank you very much. You know, I don't want to, you know, it's just too stressful. And so then like a year later, and that was when I had doubts, when I was, that was after Battleship fiasco. Yes. He reached out to me. Hey, Martin. I like, you know, you were very like into it. How, how maybe you become co-producer of my show. And at the time, I was actually struggling. For the first time in my life, I was struggling. Like all my savings were spent. Uh, my big break didn't happen. I didn't have a good agent. So I was like, okay, 
and he asked me, okay, so book the whole show. This is your, your show for tonight. I'll help you, but you know, book every comic. But I'm like, I don't know any comics. So just go open mics, tell them this. You have to bring 10 people, everything will be fine. You know? So I was telling that. And uh, the show had like 200 audience members, which I found out later was, those, are, those were dark times of Comedy Star. It was very rare. Like he, did, he on his regular shows had like 40, 50 people max. So there were like 200 people. Show was terrible. But at the time he seemed ha- he he came late, and he was he was on drugs. The next morning he's calling me, "Hey Martin, I thought you were a good guy. I always have four hundred people. I had only two hundred people. You stole from me. You hurt my business. You're terrible. But I'll give you the last chance. Pay me one hundred one thousand dollars cash, and this is your show." I'm like, no, forget it. Thank you. I, we tried. Thank you. Bye. Which yeah. night? Huh? Which night was I it? I think it was Thursday or Wednesday at the comedy store. Yeah. And I'm like, no, thank you. And then he's like, no, then I will make sure that you will never work in Hollywood. I will call every agent, every <laughs> manager, every comedy club. I'll talk everyone. I will, you will be blacklisted. So he's at those real lines. Yeah, I still like have th- them. Those are so cliche. It's on lines. Facebook. I still have them on my computer. Wow. Uh, saved up just in case someone w- that he will say never said it. I have that in my computer, so of course he did. And um, but I f- I forgave him. I mean I don't care anymore, you know. But at the time, but that is the second time in my life where I was a reactionary. So when someone threatens me, I don't really get scared i i automatically think about oh yeah let's see so i decided to go to flappers comedy club in burbank offer them a show produced it packed it on on sunday night i think at 4 p.m using the same comics it was in the main room Using the same comics I had on this one night because I didn't know any comics. Yeah. I didn't know nothing about stand-up comedy. I didn't know about producing comedy shows. I didn't know nothing about it. And then they offered me Tuesdays, 10 p.m. to produce a the show there. And I started expanding my, you know, like, because comic, the comics brought more, their friends, their other comics. Hey, Martin, put this guy. I'm like, sure, because I didn't know any comics. Yeah, sure. Next week. Two weeks from now. So I started being like a comedy producer. And, uh, and then... Wayans, Did the, you usually go up on the shows? I was hosting it. That was my only, the only rule I had. I was hosting it. But I wasn't really an experienced comic, so I didn't do much time because at the time I wasn't very good yet. You know, like uh, I really I had no experience. Yeah. I so did two th- shows how, how in my entire life. A few minutes? Yeah, I did a few minutes up front. And I'll did you go f- up between the comics? I'll tell you a funny story. So yeah. in my first couple of shows... I was doing Anthony Jeselnik's jokes. <laughs> yeah, all right. I was doing like his, really jokes. his jokes. His jokes. Yes. Then somebody told me, hey, man, you can't do it. Those are Jeselnik's jokes. And I said, I know, but you, that's not, you, you can't do it in comedy. Why? I'm, I'm an actor. I'm just doing his material. No, you can't do it, man. That's his material. You have to do your own material. I'm like, really? I didn't know nothing about comedy, man. Yeah. I thought it's like, you know, reading a script that, you know, that it, that's what actors do. That's what I was taught in the acting school. Yeah. That you work with Shakespeare script, you know, or somebody else's. I'm like, why, why can I do his material? I like his material. I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you, did you stop? Oh, yeah. I had to stop because somebody told me, somebody called, called me on it. And I said, it's, it's a big no, no, no in comedy. You know? Yes. And I'm like, okay, I didn't know. Sorry. I mean, I apologize for that. You know, like, what did I know? I didn't know. So, and I, like, listen, I, I said it, you know, like, I didn't know. I, I did a, a month at the Flappers where I was doing Anthony Jeselnik's jokes. Yeah, but if you don't know, it's no problem. Yeah, because yeah. I was new to this. Yeah. But then Damon Way and Senior started coming. He heard about the show. He needed, he wanted to do a comeback. So he started doing like 30 minutes on my show every Tuesday. And wow. the word got out. So I had more people coming. Uh, was it still that uh, the comics needed to bring some people? You know what, like, I was always kind of flipping it. Yeah. So I was like using my experience. Hey, 
this is what I went through. Can you help me? Because I'm trying to make a good show. Yeah. But the club, the club doesn't care. And it still doesn't. It's a little bit for com- better for comedy because more people generally go to see comedy. Yeah. But at the time, it wasn't like that yet. It was 2012, 2013. So my idea was, I was sending emails to agents, man. I, really, I was really bringing, bringing industry to shows, you know? Like, yeah. I was really making a lot of work to make it work, you know, to, to, to give this something extra to comics. Yeah. But I, I was asking them to help me out. Yes, I was. I yeah. wasn't, like, rude about it. I wasn't, like, I wasn't checking even how many they brought. I, yeah. I never had, like, ask on, like, at the door, like, and on those other shows, ask how many people, like, who they came to see. Yeah, I've heard did, about that. I never did that, but I had to ask them to help me out. I wouldn't yeah. be able to get the numbers that were r- requested from me, you know? Yeah. Did, did you make money with that? Yeah, but uh, at the Flappers, very little. Yeah. Because the deal was terrible. Yeah. It was between 20 and 50% from, from the door. Yeah. So there's and, definitely and if, some... If, 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 if free tickets didn't count, yeah. Yeah. So there was other values... Than the money. Oh, I mean, for me, it was a very exciting thing, you know, like, oh, you know, because I have my own show at a comedy club. That's pretty cool. You know, yeah. it's pretty cool. And, and and in my first year, I had people who became very instantly famous. Like the, the people are, you know, in my first year of the, because I always had a good eye on talent, you know, because yeah. listen, I went through acting schools, acting classes, and I can tell if someone is good or not. I had the guy who's now known as King Batch, starting with me, my first year at Flappers. You know who the, who he is, right? King Batch. King Batch. No, no, sorry. He's no. like the biggest Instagram star, like a YouTuber or whatever. I'm gonna check him out. Oh no, he's he's got a huge following. Yeah, he's in movies now and stuff. Men on Matthews. I had, I had people who became became big. Yeah. Later on. That's cool. So so comedy store. Yeah, you were talking about Damon Wayans. Okay, and Damon Wayans started coming, so the word got out, and then yeah. Whitney Cummings because she she lives not far from there. She started coming. So I had Whitney Cummings and Wayans Brothers and some more professional comics were showing interest in my show. So I had, I started having like Thomas Dale, um, who else? Um, Kay Vaughn, Marilyn Race Cup, Brian Kiley, you know, the Emmy winning writer for, uh, for, for Conan, you know. So those people started like asking to put them in shows. And I'm like, sure, of course. Think, you know, yeah, absolutely. Come, of course, whenever you want. And uh, so the show, be- you know, like the sh- show became actually a very good show. What do you think was the main thing that so much audience came? How did you make it? I think because it was Tuesday, 10 p.m., I was still getting away with having 50, 60 people. There was, the club was super happy about it. So, How many does it fit? I haven't been there for a while. I think 100 plus. Yeah. All right. But, but they, on normal shows, they had like 10 people at the time. All right. So, so I was a big deal for them. Like that, like they tried to they tried to take host, hosting away from me. My first couple of months, they're like, "Hey, Martin, well, how about you stay only producer?" Um, no, because I knew, hey, I'm a performer. I will I will make my way up. You know, like I have to perform. I have to I have to I have to get better. I have to I have to, you know. So I, I'm like, without me hosting, there's no show. Yeah. And then then they had to like, okay, because Ooh. I was bringing so much business. Were Were you good? I was getting better. Nice. I wasn't bad. Yeah. I wasn't as good as I would be right now, for sure. Cool. So you were able to have that 50, 60 people, at least. Yes. That's and I was cool. always inviting my own friends, and they were supporting me. I always had you know, a lot of friends around me. Like, uh, uh, a month ago, after a long break, I did the show at the Improv, which yes. I was technically producing, but I didn't promote it, like, widely, you know? Because I wanted to keep it in the house. I, I, did it, I wanted to do it just for my friends. And still, 70 people, I think 60 or 70 people showed up. And all of them were my friends, only my friends. Yeah. Is, is, big pro- is any part of that uh, Polish community? Yeah, yeah, huge, huge part of it. Yes. Well, I do the same thing with the uh, Finnish people. Yeah, huge. Yeah. That's good. That's so, good. So, so what happened was after a year at Flappers, Comedy Store called me. And they're like, hey, Martin. Called you? Yeah. Emailed me, actually. But, but that's really nice that they approach you. Yeah, they approach me. Yeah. Wow. Adam, at the time, was a manager. He's now the talent manager. Yes. He's, you know, like the number one guy at, at the store. At the time, he was just a manager. So he was on the business. Side. Adam Eget. Yeah. Yeah. So he emailed me, hey, Martin, I can give you a shot if you want. But I'm like, can I, can I get the guy who screwed me over? I asked for his dates, and they were given to me. So I took my revenge. So you saved a thousand bucks also? 
No, I would never pay him ten thousand bucks. Yeah, I mean that you got the <laughs> you got the dates without paying him thousand bucks too. So, but you know what? And and here's the thing. I did it once that I got into acting deeper because I wanted to prove something to people in Poland. Then I got into producing comedy, which was never my goal. I ne- it was never my goal because someone threatened me. And I've been at the comedy store for four years. I started. The show was inconsistent, although it was packed at the beginning. It had balance between amateur comics and headliners. But at the end, last two years, it was actually mainly big comics. And the last year, year four, it was 2017, when I changed into Martin Harris and Friends. It was every Friday, 7 p.m. at the bedroom. It was pretty much mainly headliners. Yeah. And some of them huge, like Drew Carey, Jada Padov, Bill Burr, Joe Rogan. And, oh, the important thing. So in the, when I got to Comedy Store, everybody started, you know, wanted to be my friend right away. Like right away, like nobody, like before I had to hustle to get like parts and stuff. Now everybody was like kissing my ass. Everybody. Uh, because the I was the hottest and... producer at the Comedy Store. Because the, oh. at the time they were still in crisis. I had big crowds. I had good show. It still had some... It's, I called it 50-50 show, that 50% were up and comers, 50% headliners. And you were still hosting? I was still hosting. But overall, the show was much better than any other independent show. For like, sure, if you're, those are the names that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So it had always at least six headliners, paid regulars. At least six. Wow. So it had like, for example, the regular lineup will be like, let's say... Some eight up and comers doing five minutes. Yeah. But then you had Tia Vaughn, Kirk Fox, let's say Ian Edwards, uh, Bill Burr, uh, Marilyn Race Cup, and Whitney Cummings. Wow. So it's still a good show, right? Well, it's a very good show. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So the show was always good, and, 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 but I wasn't ready for that mentally, I think, you know, because I was hustling, I was pushing. And in the first year, I was offered to co-host a podcast for All Things Comedy with Ian Edwards. Then I was signed by the manager, signed by an agent. I started having producer reaching out to me. Stand-up agent? Stand, no, stand no, 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 acting. no, acting agent. Yeah. You see, like, because I didn't work on my stand-up, and that's one thing I regret. Like, one thing I regret that I didn't use this opportunity to, to, really, uh, you know, to really work on my comedy. And up until now, I didn't really work on my comedy because I was so overwhelmed by the producing side. And I just didn't know, but now I know that you cannot do both. You know, if you want to be an artist, you just be an artist. If you, if you, in comedy, there's a clear line between being a performer. The line is, you know, to do shitty open mics. Then you try to get, you know, that you try to get in a sh- to a showcase. Then you try to be a door guy. And then you build your way to comedy world that way. And that's the right way. I did a very good show. I helped a lot of people. But still, at the end of the day, I was them, not us. Yes. And I, f- and I found it out in year four, and I'm like, what is wrong? You know, like, there's something wrong. There's something I hate about it. I've accomplished everything I wanted. I've done, I, I got on TV. I got on films. I played myself in a documentary with, with Larry David, Jeff Garland, you know, like. What's the documentary? It's called Where Have, Where Have You Gone, Louis DiMaggio. It has Howie Mandel, like all the comedy legends, and me. What's your point of view there? Uh, it's about a guy who tries to make a comeback to stand up after 20 years of not doing it, who was used to be big. So I've he, heard about the documentary. Yes, yeah, so I play myself. I play the guy who brings him back. So All I right. I play myself, you know, like I, I like we have that, like the, the scene there where I come to him doing a mic and hey, man, I want to give you a shot at the comedy store. I liked your jokes, you know, and stuff like that. And then, you know, like we have the whole beat and they, they take a, uh, the shot of me sitting in the, in the audience and, and, and I'm like, um, yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Nice. So, so I was very successful. And you, yeah, and you said that the agents and managers approach you, producers approach yeah, you. Yeah, I did the movie with Lindsay Lohan, thanks to Comedy Store, you know, in, in, in uh, Belgium and, and UK. What movie? It's called Among, Among the Shadows. Wow. And people were literally kissing my ass. I was invited to all the events. I was always, you know, the popular guy. But that I sounds I, good. Yeah, you have a, your then, own show at Comedy Store. But, you know, but then what happened after two years of doing this? 
because I, I I kind of forgot about acting for for a little bit. After the battleship, I'm like, nah, I'm not gonna make it. That that was my chance. I blew it. That's it. You know, done. But then I booked a role on the last ship. Eleven days out of the blue. Last ship. A movie. Yeah. A TV show for TNT. Out okay. of the blue, I was so unprepared that I found out that I lost my green card. And the next day, I have a shoot. Twelve at twelve, I went to the immigration center for a copy. And they said, you have to wait one month for that. I'm like begging them, begging, that's my biggest chance. That's my only chance. And they put a stamp in my passport that I temporary green card, you know? Wow. Yeah, man, that was the super stressful. That doesn't never happen. Like they don't, they usually follow the rules pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So I did, uh, so I did the last ship and then I did Among the Shadows in, uh, in, um, in Belgium, and then people started approaching me to do more stuff, and then I booked a TV show with Martin Freeman called Startup in Puerto Rico, and I'm like, oh shit, what have I done? What the hell have I done? Why am I in this producing comedy business where now I can make it as an actor? Why the hell am I doing that? What's wrong with me? And then I started overthinking a little bit and I, and I got very depressed and I'm like, I'm, I'm done with it. I can't do it anymore. When was this? By year three at the store, I'm like, I just, it's, I'm in, because they all see me this as... This is like a couple of years ago, around two... Yeah, yeah 2016. Uh, yeah. That, was, that, was the, that was the breaking role, uh, year for me, you know? Yeah. Where things started happening for me and I'm like, this is what I want to do. I don't want to do... And I was writing a show, TV show. I was approached by Spencer Baumgart at the time agent at CAA was representing the show. It was my original idea. I was writing with the other guy. Never came, never happened with it, but I was pretty sure I'm going to sell a TV show in a second. Yeah. It's going to happen next month. But then we had producer. We were meeting showrunners, people who had used to showrun shows. Do you want to tell uh, what was it about? Not yet, because I'm still, I'm still thinking about making it eventually. Cool. You would have acted in that too. Yeah, but I, I wanted to have my own show, man. I wanted to sell my own show and be, take the big paycheck and, and, you know, and, and live comfortably. Nice. My house and stuff, you know? Yeah, cool. And then, then that was like going, you know, like started dragging. And, and, and then I started like being pinned on things and it, it, the roles went to bigger actors, you know? Like I knew that I should have booked a recurring guest on the show Strain, but it went to a guy who was a, a lead on another show at the same network. I booked Hidden Figures. But they for, forgot, like they forgot that I wasn't locally in Atlanta, and they told me to show up on set the next day, six a.m., and I was in L.A. I couldn't make it, you know. That was a heartbreaker. And uh, then I did looping on X Men Apocalypse and on Zookeeper's Wife, and I did uh, co-star on the Making History, and I did. Rec- and with looping, just be clear. So you made sound. Yeah, yeah, sound. What, what language did you speak there? Uh, Polish and and I think German. Yeah. And um, and then I did uh, this word. Have you gone, Louis DiMaggio? I did uh, Making History. I did uh, Scorpion. I was pinned for another couple of things, you know. And then I did uh, recurring role and on Days of Our Lives. That, pinned means that you. Can you tell me what pinned means? You're on a veil. Like pretty pretty much, you're either between you're another actor or you are the casting's choice. That happened to me a lot, especially recently. But that's okay. Yeah, so, I found out about what the pin means. That. The, I, I I don't know if I'm correct, but they put your picture on the wall and they put the pin that you're yeah. there, right there. But at the same time, my show was super big hit at the comedy store. Yeah. But I didn't want to do it anymore. And the worst part is because show was such a big hit. It was always packed, always had great comics. I had people constantly harassing me, text messages, emails, personally. I couldn't go anywhere. They were like... And sometimes they were like, oh, you don't want to put me in the show, you motherfucker. I fucking hate you, this, you shit, piece of shit, you know? And I didn't expect that. I never knew that side of show business. It yeah. was new to me. So I started, like, escaping from people, especially from comics. Whenever I saw a comic, I didn't want to be around comics because I, they are, I knew what they want. So I started going back home, and I was, I was drinking a lot of wine just to cool down. And then I and, and back I, home meaning home in LA. Yeah, yeah. And and I just I just I just I think got depressed. I just burned out, man. At the end of that year, I just burned out uh, because I was still working. I was working for Universal as a co-producer on Polish edition of E News. I was still trying to write about sports. I, I my two books that I published 
they just came out, 2014, 2015. So you did sports all this time? I did, the- everything. And then I had a show sometimes three times a week. At Comedy Store? Yeah. Oh, so it was many times a week? Bec- no, because they kept adding me days because the show was so successful. They're like, yeah. just roll, roll with it, roll with it. What do you think and was I didn't th- say no. What do you think was the main audience at the end? Oh, it was everybody. Some came to see some comics and some came to see me and some came to see, you know, because the show was hot. Yeah. And if you have that kind of names. Oh, everybody wanted to be in the show. Everybody wanted to be in the show. Some people, I couldn't, I, for example, I couldn't advertise Judd Apatow. And I couldn't advertise Bill Burr. Yeah. But I knew I, I was getting email or a text message from, from telling the manager the stuff that they will be in the show. So I knew that I prepared. They, I called them special celebrity guests. Yeah. And people said, oh, he's just doing amateur show with pop-ins. Bullshit. I was the only guy at the comedy store who was putting the names of performers on the website. Every single one of them. Yeah. Sometimes I was putting special celebrity guests, not because I was hoping I'm going to drag someone there, but because I knew who the guest is. I just couldn't say who, who it yeah. is. Yeah. And this, this is still not financially that you could live off. Oh, that. yeah, I could have lived it. Well, when I was doing three shows at the comedy store, oh, yeah, hell yeah, I did. I, wow. d- I did make money on it, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yes, I did. Not a lot. There are certain producers. I was still, I would say, the lowest paid producer of, of them all. Yeah. But all those other guys were just producing shows. Like, they didn't have a career like I started having. Yeah. You know, so, so for them, that was a full-time job. And then you burned out. Then I just couldn't take it anymore, man. Like, I have those people in my space. I'm like, I don't want to escape from people. I want to work with people, man. I want to collaborate. I want to I do artistic stuff. And the problem is, when you're in this business situation, now I get it, you know? Like, they, that's why I said it was too soon for me, and I wasn't ready for that. Because when you jump into this job as a comedy producer, and you make it big... That's all they see you as a comedy producer. They don't see you as a talent. I had CAA agents, William Morris agents, biggest managers coming to my shows, congratulating me on a great show. But it wasn't about me. Like, hey, Martin, maybe we represent you. We'll put you in more shows, like TV shows. We've heard that you're doing something, some acting. You're actually pretty good. No. It was always, you had a great show, great talent. Then how can I contact this guy? How can I contact that guy? Can I come? Can I send my, can I send my, can I send my uh, junior agent next time? So I'm like, and, and I started being very frustrated. So I, st- I started being a little bit snappy at times. S- I got into some, you know, verbal exchanges with people. I left the podcast with Ian uh, Edwards, which was a very stupid. From you, left, you had a podcast, but you left it. I left it, yeah. I told him, no, I'm done with it. I don't have time. Fucking dude. That was terrible. That was terrible, man. But I, now I'm back on it, you know, like as, as a recurring guest and we're very good friends right now again, you know, he, we, 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 we got together last year and then we talked about it and he, I think he understands that it was just, you know, I was, I was thrown into a deep water and asked to swim in sharks. Yeah. And although I didn't do anything bad, it, I, you know, I suffered internally. I didn't burn any bridges technically. I didn't. Because, you know, I, I went there actually to the store three weeks ago and everybody's super nice to me and they actually, even when I was leaving, oh, so... 2017, I was like, nah, man, I'm done with it. I can't do it anymore. It's not for me. It's not what I want to do in life. I'm like, yeah. This is not what I want to do. I know it's a, it's a great show, and on the night of the show, I'm enjoying it. But the six other days, I hate it. Because eh, all the time, people are contacting me. People are calling me names. People are accusing me of this, accusing me of that, which... Because becoming, they want the spot in the show. You want a spot in the show or they feel like they have to get, they feel like I owe them, you know, like the, a lot of comics feel like the world owes them. And well, but now I get it from the other perspective because there's so much hustle and struggle on their end because now I started going to mics myself and, and actually, and actually some people take care of me, you know, who I take, took care of when, when, when they were uh, trying to get something, you know, some people never talked to me again after I left comedy store. Some people stayed my friends and I know who my real friends are. This was a good Life's lesson, but uh, but I took it, I took it hard, you know. Like when when I, when I left comedy, I was spent, and then ninety five percent of the people that were in my space just disappeared, completely disappeared. Hmm. But I just switched to acting, and uh, it was a hard, it was a hard, uh, it was a decision I, I made, and I asked, you know, they didn't want to let me go at, at first. I tried to quit three times, and then the fourth time they said, okay, you know, all right. If that's what you want, that's what you want. 
And what happened after that when you st stopped comedy? Just turned my attention to acting. I had, a, I, you know, I was lucky that I did MacGyver. Um, you did MacGyver uh, right after after I left Comedy Store in January 2018. Yeah, so, what so did I you did, play? I played like a head of Ukrainian mafia. Cool. Oh, you know, the only problem is I had a gas mask on the whole time, so I did. They couldn't use it really for 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 my reel, but I still get good residuals for that. And and then I started building the networks of my agents. I started investing in my acting, and I I feel like. And I started meditating a lot. I was I, that was a big trauma. Like I was suffering internally. I was like very disappointed with some people. I was disappointed with show business, but at the same time, I was disappointed with myself that I that I kind of lost track of what I was what I came here to do. You know, that I that I kind of got away from me. You know, which like, is performing, which is performing, being a being an artist, being an actor. You know, like because I want I. I felt like na with naivety that I wanted to change, transform the comedy scene. I wanted to make it fair and better. But there is no fair and better, man. This is just the way business works. The clubs want, you know, butts in the seats. Comics want the stage time. It's so simple, you know. The, the fact that you have a great show, cool, but nobody really cares. Nobody cares, except of the audience. But they go home and they, they have other things to do. So technically nobody cares. Hmm. There's air, uh, not airplanes, helicopters yeah. in Hollywood. So you booked the MacGyver. Yeah, I booked MacGyver, and then I felt that you know there'll be book more, and I booked some 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 nice gigs, you know, like voiceover. But I was I was I was I was not well, you know, overall. Like I was really like I, I had like a crisis, but I think it was also a kind of mid age crisis because I turned forty, you know. And I was like back to square one. I didn't know what to do really, you know. So, so that was difficult. So I just did decided. you have a relationship or anything? No, like? no, not at all. Because when I was at the county store and, and and I was working all those other places, I was working so hard. I I, I, I was just working nonstop, man. And and, and I, I I didn't build any relationships really. I started building relationships last uh, since last year, like in terms of friendships and stuff. And and but now, now I'm in romantic a good place. or anything? No, no, just work. Just work. Now I'm in a much better place overall. Much better place. So, w what happened then? Like, it was a tough year last year. It was a transitional year, and I d didn't have a good luck. Like, things could have could have happened a little bit better for me because um, I was pinned for Creed Two. I was pinned for Pale Blue Dot, big Natalie Portman movie. I think it's called now Lucy in the Blue Sky, uh, for for a really nice role of a German astronaut. I was pinned for Ford v Ferrari. I was on the veil for two other things. Uh, I did Brock Meyer, but they cut out my scene. But I still think the scene will make it in the next season because there are two big actors in the scene and I had a small, small part in it. I don't think they'll s scrap it completely. I think they'll use it eventually. Uh, I did some voiceover here and there, but got myself an agent in Atlanta. But I was pretty much searching for, for happiness and um, meditating a lot, going to gym every day, starting to make friendships. And I decided to, to do some simple jobs just to understand, you know, just to love life again. Because I was really hating life at, at the end of my comedy, producing comedy experience. So, so I started coaching kids, uh, soccer, little kids. I started working brand ambassador gigs, giving flyers to people 6 a.m. in the morning at the at metro station in, in downtown. I worked for one month at the kitchen utensil store. And... Uh, and at the end of last year, I'm like, I can find happiness in small things, you know. And, and then the New Year's started. I, I got about a little bit to sports writing, although a lot of the doors were closed because I haven't done it for a long time. But I, you know, learn how to be humble again. Because, listen, when I was a big shit at the comedy store, I was a little bit arrogant. I'm not going to lie. I was, you know, I was the king. I was the king there. Now I had to humble myself. And uh, for acting, that was the best thing that could have happened to me because at the beginning of the year, I booked The Hunt. I booked Oldman Rush. And Hunt is the one that what got canceled. By Universal. But it will come out. It's too big of a movie. Yeah. Of course it will come out. So, sorry, you booked Hunt and you were talking about the other names. Uh, Oldman Rush, where I... I don't know if you're into hockey, ice hockey. Sure. Okay, so it's an ice hockey movie and it had son of Wayne Gretzky and daughter of Mario Lemieux in it. Wow. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And so they flew me first to... Louisiana for the hunt, and then the next week for Oldman Rush in Syracuse. And I'm like, oh, I'm on a good track again, I think. 
And then I booked a you know little horror movie here I did. Very cool role over like head of a Russian um horror house. Really good when I would I treat girls like like you know like like meat, you know. So it was a pretty juicy role. And then I did uh, Spider Man, uh voiceover on Spider Man. Then I did uh, which I cannot reveal, um a big video game that is coming out in two months, huge. One of the lead characters. And Voice. Yes. And and uh, I'm doing uh, World War Two based uh, short, really cool. Next uh, next month, and I audition a lot. I was close to. I'm I'm getting a lot of auditions now because I think my work is much better. It's much more subtle. I think my acting coach told me that I made a huge progress this year. He asked me, "How did you do that? You made a huge progress." I said, "Pain." Pain. Pain gave me a lot of layers that uh, that I didn't have before. Before I could only play like a high adrenaline type of guys. Now I can, I can play all types of guys. I'm very confident in my acting. Sometimes I feel like because I do all those other jobs, I might not have greatest energy at the day. And sometimes I feel lonely, of course, you know, because I haven't. That that's the one thing that that didn't happen to for me in LA. But now I, I look into the future and. Oh, and I started doing uh, doing a little bit of comedy on the side. I did Love Factory once. I did did improv. I did, I was very scared. I I thought everybody hates me in comedy. Just as a performer. Yeah, I, I I thought everybody would hate me, and it's not a case, you know. Like some people probably do, but most of the people actually don't. Most of the people are very nice to me and very welcoming. And uh, and I've I then I understood that all the problem that, that happened was in my own hat. It seems like that uh, everything is going pretty well. So. What do you want from the What do you want from the future, apart from the bond thing? I want as many gigs as possible, and I want to. Uh, I, I'm discussing with Polish Network about my own TV show uh, uh, that I'm that I wrote, and uh, I wanna I wanna mix it up between Europe and LA. I miss Europe, and I. Wanna, oh yeah, that's what I mean. So sorry, I'll ask in a moment. Yeah, and I want to, and I want to, I want to be a be a also on the side. A good good comedian. Yeah, I want I want to do. I think it's the best I've been as a comic. I think I have now good material where I'm actually performing, not. And that's the one thing I regret the most from my experience at the comedy store that I, because I was being paid, I had this, and I'm Catholic, you know, so this is a very Catholic thing. I had that guilt that I shouldn't expose myself too much and promote too much, which was stupid because I should have performed, and I just limited my performance. I wanted to put the light on the other comics. And nobody else done that. Like uh, all the other promoters, pretty much m- made themselves looking great, most and foremost. Yeah. Did you go up between the comics? Yeah, but I was pretty much bringing people up. Yeah. Plus, plus because I was overwhelmed with all the producing side, man. I, 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 I couldn't think about funny stuff when I'm just stressed about you know who, who is at the door and then there's somebody texting me, then somebody oh they didn't they didn't let me in and this and this. You know, it's just a lot of stuff that that is happening, especially when you have. You know, 200 people, 100 people at the door, you know. There's so much stuff that is happening. And then you have to make sure that the show is being run properly and that the comics are in the right order, you know, that it makes sense from the artistic standpoint. Yeah. And and for me, the promoting and producing part was the most stressful because it's not my natural habitat, you know. I What I succeeded in the most, I think, was that the show was good artistically. Like even the newer comics, they were all good. They were. I I never put like people I knew they are bad. Yeah. Or didn't see. I, I I never put people I haven't seen before. Yeah. So even if some of them were newer, I still knew that they will at least be solid. They won't like suck completely. Yeah. Where the shows I did when I started those two shows and the shows that were still at the comedies at the time. Some of those, some of those shows were just bring ten people, and uh, I don't care. Yeah, I know. I've been getting that kind of emails too. And the problem is, I felt like sometimes people put me in that bucket with those bad promoters just by association, and that was the main reason. And I did that to to be uh, to be different, you know. Like the yeah. main reason I jumped into this is to not be like all those other people, and now I'm being accused I'm one of them. Like that was the most hurtful. That that was the one thing that was hurting me the most. Yeah. Do you think uh, your reputation has been cleared somewhat? I don't think my reputation was ever bad. Yeah, but you, 
sorry, did I misunderstand that you said that you, some people thought that you were yeah, one of them? Because as I said, it's a business. Once you're a promoter, you're a promoter. Yeah. You're not seen as a comic. You're seen as a promoter. Even if for me, promoting was just a tool to have a great show. Yeah. But I didn't know those little, you see, differences, you know, like that you either this or that. I haven't, I, I, I haven't thought about it because it was all, all new to me, you know. I understand. So even if I think I wouldn't do anything different, if, if from the producing, promoting perspective, I wouldn't do anything different because I think the product was very, very good and high quality. I don't think I should have, should have done it. But at the same time, if I didn't have that experience, I wouldn't understand show business as well as I do now. Yeah. And and I wouldn't understand myself what's my role in it as good as I do right now, because now I know. So, if I could get that experience and that knowledge without doing those shows, I mean I benefited from those shows, you know, in a lot of ways, and also I'm enhancing my performance skills. So, and I helped a lot of people. I really did. I hooked up people with agents, managers, and and you know, helped them to advance their careers. And some people are still very grateful to me. So, nice. it's just, it's just. The, the the problem I'm having with all that is that uh, it it's just not it's not the job I was ever interested in doing and I kind of uh, let life push me that way. It's, yeah. And I sh- I think I quit when I should have quit and that's it. That's good. So what's your relationship with LA now? Because you've been talking about other cities, other countries. I, I've been here for ten years, you know. So I feel like I want to mix it up. I don't, I feel like I'm I'm, be, I'm being here a little bit too long because I went through growing pains here. And I, when I was first, you know, trying, I wasn't very good. Right now, I'm very good. So I think maybe it's time to try different markets and 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 come as a finished product and not the finished product because you never finish product as an actor artist, you know. But as a good product. To show myself, you know, more in, in London or maybe New York even, you know, because here in LA, I was still going through growing pains because I started from the scratch and I was in my mid thirties when I started pretty much. So, you know, for someone with no experience who came here from a different country to have all those credits and experience and, you know, comedy star, TV shows, films and, 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 and other stuff, I think it's pretty good. I, I don't think I failed. No, I, I, I don't think so either. So, <laughs> so you're thinking about moving Somewhere else. I'm thinking about trying for a couple of months in London because I'm getting good stuff out of it and I want to book because I really like... You see, like, when I started in my first years, I looked at acting as getting credits, getting on a show, getting on a film. Where right now I'm thinking more about, you know, what the show is, what the film is, what how what characters I want to play. I'm more interested in, in, in you know, in the, like, deeper understanding of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm like, I'm a... I'm a conscious actor I see a lot of great projects in London that I want to be part of yeah simple as that and I think LA is in a little bit of a, a crisis right now in terms of in terms of of course there's stuff being made here but not necessarily more than in Atlanta or London you know so if I could and already in Atlanta, I have a very, very good reputation because they already saw me. I started submitting auditions there last year. So they already saw me as a much better actor. Where here, I think, when I started, I was okay. You know, I wasn't ever, I was never bad. But definitely not at the level I'm in right now. Yeah. And I think in two years, I'll be in an even better level, you know. For sure. So in terms of producing, I'm happy to be on a creative side. I will never be on the... On the, on the side of picking talent, you know, that's just, I, I don't have, I don't have a uh, stomach for that. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, one, I, I, I understand. And one last topic that I wanted to ask you is about someone starting their, especially acting career here as a foreigner and with the accent. Mm-hmm. So what kind of thoughts and ideas do you have about? It depends like, on the, of the yeah. age. Yeah. If they're young, I would say start at, start in your country, make yourself big through your local market, and then then try here. Don't come here first. I would say that's the advice. If I if I was started in my twenties, I would have started in Poland, but I knew it was too late for me in Poland. I wouldn't get a shot, so I had to gamble, and I did gamble, and the gamble worked. And now I can go to Poland, possibly work in Poland on big things. I mean, I, I actually have an offer of a really great project that will possibly happen early next next year, that will be my first thing in Poland. And it looks like, like I will be part of it, and I'm playing a part that actually I picked in the script. Uh, 
Nice. So, so I'm not really interested in being, you know, celebrity, as I said. I, like, for me, like, the way I wanted my career to go, because I'm a very private person and I, I'm an introvert, you know, I was, I was a bookworm as a kid. Yeah. I like the, I would like to have a career like, you know, Francis McDormand, like, like Michael Stuhlbarg, Ethan Hawke, you like those kind that, that's the type of a career I want to have. Not like, you know, I'm not going to be DiCaprio, Brad Pitt or, or Channing Tatum. I want to be yeah. a character actor who works a lot, does good roles, good projects, works a lot and it, and it has a nice balance between, you know, life and work. Yeah. I have to say that I I have a different opinion with that when you people should move here. I think people if they when I move to LA they should come here as soon as possible. Why? Because they'll get their, they'll get their neck broken like I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's part of life. I just yeah, you're right. That Actually, I got better because of that. Yeah, yeah. you're right. I, I feel that the youth is so valued here, and you start meeting people from the first day when you come to LA, and you start building it. Because I went to school in Miami, and that was a great theater school. But um, when I was younger, and then I moved to L.A., this was 2005. This is my second trip here now. So um, I couldn't start building any L.A. network before I moved here. Mm -hmm. So I got good training in Miami, but uh, I didn't build any network there for L.A. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's... I've. I don't know. I mean, I, I think if I if I take a break for like two three weeks, I'll be able to reflect more, because it's that that the 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 whole time, especially the last three four years, where so many things happened. Yeah. That I would still have to think about it, you know. Yeah, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I just feel that I have a different opinion with that. With that. I just I just feel that you know it took me a time to be good you know like I I had to mature as an actor like I I was completely green and blue and 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 then you know things happen and I think that's my first year where I'm very comfortable with with what I do yeah. although sometimes I'm very critical of myself you know I'm very very critical of myself you know like I watch tapes and I'm like ah do you know could I hear it a little bit maybe should I you know like sometimes I like I like to analyze yeah and uh, another question about this. What's your relationship with uh, being a foreigner and having accent? You know, the good thing is that I speak different languages and, uh, and uh, I'm able to do different accents uh, and I go for different parts where I can, you know, even try different lines in different languages. I, I, I did lines in Danish on Scorpion. Yes. On The Hunt, I did in Croatian. On the, I did German a lot. I did Russian a lot. So I, take, I use it as my advantage. But I know because of my look, especially now when I will uh, in my 40s, although I still look like late 30s, but I'm, I'm, I started looking older, you know, like th this year especially, a little bit, you know, I, I can feel that. I think, uh, I, think I, have to, I, have to, I have to get an um, American accent eventually, I have to. Do, do you think it's uh, possible? Yes. I, I know so, because I know people who did that. Yeah. Because I'm still on my way, and I know that there's, it's going it's to take a while. Oh, it's going to take a while for sure. Yes. Especially for Finnish people. That's the worst, you know? <laughs> Finnish people have like the worst accent. Just kidding. <laughs> well, that's the way I feel. Anything else you have in mind? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like comedy is in a Finnish business, you know? Like I, I, feel, I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm still do it, you know? And I'm, and I think, uh, I'm still wired that way sometimes, you know, where I, where Ideas of funny bits just come to my head, and I feel like, dang, that I didn't didn't think of it five years ago. But you know, it is what it is. And and uh, as I said, like overall, I'm, I think you know, uh, like it it all, all everything happens for a reason. And um, and I feel like I had a very good legacy there. It's just you know the problem was that I was being appreciated because I was. And rewarded for not something I wanted to be rewarded for. And, 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 and at some point I realized that and decided to move on. Cool. Where can we see your comedy? Uh, it's still work in progress. I mean, I don't want to put it out uh, if it's not ready. I'm working on the bits right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm keep picking shows that are a little bit under the radar and, and working out stuff. And, and then I think I'll be ready around like late November for, for something bigger. Cool. Oh, one last question. <laughs> What what's your last name? What do you use? 
Um, I, I know what they are, but which one do you use now? You know, it's funny because in, in England I use my family name and, and here I go by Martin Harris. To America, Martin Harris and... Yeah. And in England, Martin... Harasimovic. Harasimovic. Cool. Because that's what my agent told me. It would be much better for British market because, you know... And it makes sense. It's Europe. Listen, it's Europe. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for oh, being thank here. thank you. Thank you. Let's see you... Uh, I'll see you at the comedy shows. Thank you. Martin Harris. <laughs> or Harasimovic. Thank you for listening to that episode of With Miska podcast. You can find the podcast on iTunes or is it Apple podcast? Then my website, miskakajanus.com. Thank you so much. Have a good day.